Security in Drupal, what could possibly go wrong is the way you're supposed to read that title. Um, so the introduction about me, I'm Benji Fisher. Um, the yellow pig is my avatar um, on drupal.org, um, GitHub, GitLab. I don't use Twitter or X anymore, but uh, anyway, that's, that, that, that's my avatar online. And so um, I, I wear the hat to um, suggest to people who I am in case I run into someone that I've met online but never met in person before. So I, I wear the hat at conferences and, and also it remembers me not to take, it, it reminds me not to take myself too seriously. Uh, my, my username is Benji Fisher on Drupal.org, GitHub, and GitLab. Um, and I, I do a lot of contribution to Drupal core. Um, I'm a member of the usability group. We meet every Friday um, on Zoom. You can get a link to the meeting in the UX channel in Drupal Slack. I'm happy to have people join us. Um, I didn't do it today because I was here. Um, but uh, it's 1400 UTC, which is currently 10 o'clock Eastern time, and we'd love to have more people join us. Um, I'm one of the maintainers of the migration subsystem, the Migrate API. Um, and uh, for the past two years and a bit, I've been a member of the Drupal security team. And um, sort of part of the job of the security team is to educate people about security, which is why I give these presentations. Um, you can follow along. That uh, QR code will take you to the list of all of my um, presentations. And most recent first, you can click on the first one to get the live version of the talk I'm looking at. This, what we're looking at here is on my, my local computer. But they should be pretty close to identical. Um, so outline, don't get scared. Um, we're in the middle of the introduction now. I'll talk about the OWASP top 10. I'll talk about what is Drupal. Um, and then I will go through some of the, the top 10 from the OWASP, all of which are listed here, but I will only have time to talk about two in, in one session. Um, so just uh, to get an idea of what they are, let's just read through them. Um, number one is broken access control. Two is cryptographic failures. Three is injection. Four is insecure design. Five is security misconfiguration. Six is vulnerable and outdated components. Seven is identification and authentication failures. Eight, software and data integrity failures nine, security logging and monitoring failures, and 10, server-side request forgery. And then I'll just sort of wrap up. Um, so um, some of the material in, in the slide deck is cribbed from Peter Wolanin's Cracking Drupal presentations. Um, you know, Peter, if you don't know him, is one of the organizers of this event. Um, and I've also cribbed some text from um, OWASP.org, um, which is allowable because they have a Creative Commons license for their whole website, as do all of my slide decks. And if you follow that link, well, I'll, I'll follow it. It goes to the last slide on the deck, which is the <coughs> Creative Commons license. Um, oh, no. That's why I don't follow the link because I can't use the back button with. So. Right, so that's where I was. Um, so, end of the introduction. Let's talk about the OWASP top 10. Um, it is a standard awareness document for developers um, and web application security. It represents a broad consensus about the most critical security risks to web applications. And those, the OWASP te top 10 are the 10 things that I just read through. Um, the list is updated every few years. The most recent version is from 2021. Um, 
actually, <clears throat> I'm reading these slides out of order, oh well. Um, so originally when I started giving these talks, my plan was to add one of the 10 things each time I gave the presentation and talk about two of them each time. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I haven't kept up with that. I'm, I'm, I've, I have four of them. Um, and if you come to this conference again next year, maybe I'll have added another one or two by then and have something new. Um, but uh, and what is OWASP? It is the Open Web Application Security Project, which is a nonprofit foundation that works to improve the security of software. It is certainly not Drupal specific, so this is part of getting off the island. And part of what I'm trying to do here is to take an outsider's view of Drupal and ask, how secure is it? What, uh, what can we do to make it more secure and so forth? Um, and what is Drupal? Um, are there any Drupal newbies in the crowd? I, I guess you are. Mm -hmm. Okay, a few, good. So it's not just a rhetorical question, but, but even for those of you who are familiar with it, I'm trying to take the outsider's point of view. So, um, so I will pretend that you've never heard of it before. What is Drupal? It is a content management system. What does that mean? It means that it gives you forms on web pages, and it says, enter data in my forms. I will save it to my database and then use it to create web pages. That's what a content management system is. A hacker looks at that statement and says, let's get started. Um, basically, from the security point of view, a web content management system is one of the worst ideas ever. And what does a hacker think of when you present the hacker with a form? Say you have a form labeled name and you expect someone to type something like Bob or Ann. But the hacker doesn't do that. The hacker types in Robert, close quote, right paren, semicolon, drop table students, semicolon, dash, dash. So why does the hacker type in something like that? Well, the hacker imagines that when you process that input field, you're going to insert it as a variable. So if you're, if you're using PHP, you'll use something like dollar name. You'll insert it into a string, insert into students, name, values, dollar name, like you're adding something to the students table. But when you insert this input into a string like that, what you get are two SQL statements insert into students name values Robert, which looks okay, but then drop table students semicolon dash dash close quote right paren. Um, who knows what the dash dash does in the SQL statement? Yes? Comment it out. Right, the, the, the answer was commented out. That's right. So the point of, of that is that anything after drop table student semicolon gets commented out and it will not matter syntactically to SQL and will if we if the website is foolish enough to execute this SQL string it will add one thing to the students table name equals Robert but then it'll drop the whole table and probably crash the system um, how many people have seen this example before Bobby tables <laughs> Right, the, the official title is Exploits of a Mom, as I've titled this, this, um, this slide, but, but yes, Bobby Tables is the other way of, of referring to it. And, um, and about half the people, I think, in the room raise their hands, they recognize this. Um, I, I got this example from XKCD, which also uses Creative Commons licenses. So yes, I am be being responsible um, in borrowing that, uh, that cartoon for this. Slide, and that's just a little story around the same exploit. Um, so more on the question of what is Drupal. It's an active international open source software project. Um, more than a million passionate developers, designers, et cetera, et cetera, all working together. And that text is a script from the Drupal homepage. Um, Drupal takes security seriously. 
we have a security team. Um, it's been around since 2005. Um, members of the team come from four continents. I think North America, Europe, Asia, and hmm, Australia. I don't think we have anyone currently from South America. Um, and um, just at this conference, we actually have qu uh, quite a few members of the team. I'm, I'm on the team, Peter Wollenin is on the team, and Neil Drum, who uh, works for the Drupal Association, is also a member of the security team. Um, so, that's the end of the introductory material. What is OWASP? What is Drupal? Um, so, I'll, I'll pause any questions about either of those. What is OWASP? What is Drupal? So now you get to choose your own adventure. As I said, um, I've filled out four of these columns. Um, broken access control, cryptographic failures, injection, and then vulnerable and outdated components. And we probably have time to cover two of those. So what do you want to see first? Outdated components. Good choice. Well, they're all good choices. Um, so this is number six on the list from 2021. I hope I managed to finish the slide deck before they come up with a new list. Um, <clears throat> the best kept secret in web security is this. The most important things is to do all the boring stuff that you already know. It's a lot like, does this sound like clickbait? How to live a longer, healthier life. It takes just four minutes a day. Does that sound too good to be true? If you saw a link to this on, on a website, would you click it and read the article? Or does it sound like clickbait? Sounds like clickbait. Sounds like clickbait. It's true. Four minutes a day, does that ring a bell? I'll give you a hint. It's not four minutes all at once. It's two minutes twice a day. Someone is pantomiming in the back. Yes, brush your teeth. <laughs> Two minutes twice a day. It's the best advice you'll get today. You should also floss. And you really will live a longer, healthier life. So that and a bit of personal health, the important advice is the stuff you already know. And web security is the same. So you already know you should use good passwords. You already know you should not use the same password for your bank as for your website. How many people brushed their teeth within the last 24 hours? I hope everyone can raise their hands. I, I, I actually think that if, if I were like a, a manager rather than a developer, I would ask every so often at the stand-up meeting, how many people brush their teeth today? And if anyone admitted that they hadn't brushed their teeth, I'd talk with them and see if we could give them some help. Um, how many people use a password manager? Most people. Well, actually, maybe a little more than half. Um, I confess I'm still using LastPass, because that's the one I started using. And when it had problems, I never got around to moving off of it. I think that using LastPass is still better than not using a password manager. Um, if you're writing down your password somewhere or using some pattern to keep track of them, just use a password manager. Maybe you can use the one built into your browser. Like uh, Certainly Firefox and Chrome offer to save your passwords for you. Um, don't use sticky notes. Um, so, what is web security hygiene, the equivalent of the advice of brushing your teeth every day? Use good passwords, have a policy. Um, so, if you're managing a website, um, don't let people use password123 as their passwords. Um, I should have a clip to uh, Spaceballs at this point. Um, enforce good passwords. Um, the second point, which is what I'm talking about here, vulnerable and outdated components, is to keep your software up to date. 
Um, and unless hosting is your core business, do not run your own servers. I mean, it's a fun thing to do. It's educational to maintain your own little Linux server on Linode or AWS or something like that and run a website there. But don't do it if you care about that website. Do it with your personal blog where, you know, like, no one is going to scream at you if it goes down for a couple of days. Um, but, but, you know, keeping the web server secure is not a full-time job, but it's more time than you want to invest if you've got other things to do. So to get more Drupal specific, you should know the schedule. Um, the security release window is Wednesdays between noon and 5 p.m. Eastern time. If there is a security release for Drupal core or for contributed modules, it will be released in that time. So that is the time that you should be paying attention, checking in Slack or email or RSS, however you keep track, um, know if a security release comes out. Um, Drupal core updates um, come out um, the third Wednesday of the month. Again, not every month, but if there is going to be a Drupal security release for Drupal core, it will be the third Wednesday. Um, also know the schedule for minor version updates, like 10.2, um, 10.3. Um, that's June and December. So 10.2 came out last December. 10.3 should come out in June, um, and minor versions are supported for a year. They're covered by the security team. Um, if you are still using Drupal 10.0, that's no longer supported. It was supported for a year. When Drupal 10.2 came out, the support for Drupal 10.0 stopped. So that's the schedule for, for Drupal. Um, you should know the channels. You can check on drupal.org slash security. And it lists all the security advisories. Um, there was one this week, March. No, I'm sorry, last week. There were none this week. So March 6th is last week. Um, the contributed module registration role had a critical access bypass update last week. Um, there is an RSS feed. Uh, there are actually three RSS feeds, one for everything, one for contrib modules. I'm sorry, one for core, one for contrib, and one for public service announcements. Um, public service announcements are things like, you know, we're not actually responsible for CK Editor, but it had a security update that you might want to apply. Or, very rarely, um, there is a security update for Drupal core coming next Wednesday, and you should plan to apply it as soon as possible. So that, those are some of the types of uh, PSAs or public service announcements. Um, if you edit your user account on drupal.org, see, I think I can do this without exposing any passwords, and you go to edit, and then, what is it, my newsletters? Um, there, there used to be more on this page. This is the only one that's still there. Um, I was a little nervous that maybe they'd moved it, but, but it's, it's still here. Um, the newsletter for security announcements, as you can see, I've got it checked off, so I get those announcements sent to my email. Um, and there's a Slack channel. And if you want to hang out from 12 to 5, um, oh, you can't see my, uh, my Slack window. I won't bother. Um, but there is a Slack channel where, where it's all announced. Um, and there's also a Drupal security account both on X and on Mastodon um, that, that posts announcements of security releases. So subscribe to at least one of these channels. If not you personally, make sure someone on your team is. So most security advisories are small things. They might be contrib module you're not using. Um, 
a typical security advisory is, is sort of a minor thing that someone who already has elevated permissions might be able to do something bad to screw up your site. Um, most of them will not make your hair fall out, but occasionally one comes along that is important and you need to know. Um, another thing to understand um, about keeping your Drupal software up to date is the difference between major, minor, and patch versions. So major versions like going from 9 to 10, 10 to 11, Drupal 11 should be released sometime this year. Don't know whether it will be, what is it, July or December, but I think it'll be this year. Um, the minor versions, I should update this slide. Um, going from 10.2, which was released to, in December, to 10.3, which is coming up. Um, that's less disruptive than a major version upgrade um, and can include new features. So this is Drupal's policy for introducing new features, that they, they can be introduced in minor versions. And then when a new major version is released, it is mostly feature comp complete, well, feature, feature comparable to the minor version of the previous major that's released at the same time. So Drupal 9.5 Five was released along with Drupal 10.0, and they had basic feature uh, <laughs> feature compatibility. They were comparable in their features. Um, and then new features were introduced in Drupal 10.1. New features were introduced in Drupal 10.2. Patch versions should not be disruptive. They're mostly bug fixes. Um, and then security releases are a special case of patch releases. And we do our best to make sure they're not disruptive. We make just one change to fix the security problem. So there's just one thing being changed. A lot of attention is devoted to making sure that it is not disruptive. So the hope is that if you are currently up to date, you have the latest patch version installed, you can install the security release on top of that and be good to go. It shouldn't break anything. We're pretty good about that. And a lot of people um, put off applying the security patch. They say, well, I've got to test it. What if it breaks something? And they read the security advisory and they say, well, maybe the vulnerability doesn't apply to my site. And Basically, you, you have two options. You can take that approach. You can read the security advisory, just decide whether it applies to you, and then if it does, you apply it to your site. Or you can just go ahead and update your site. Either way, whichever one you choose, you are relying on the security team. You're trusting them. In the first case, you're trusting them to have anticipated all the ways that this security vulnerability can be exploited. And, to, and, and when they say these are the ways it can be exploited, you decide it, it doesn't apply to my site, and you might put off applying the patch. But that's hard to do. You know, hackers are very clever. And if, if we find one vulnerability and, and, and patch it, then you know, there might be other ways of exploiting it that we didn't think of. Um, the second way, if you just apply the patch, you're trusting the security team to have made sure that the update is not disruptive. And since we're updating our own code, we're familiar with how it works, that's really more reliable than describing all the mitigating factors that may or may not make it exploitable. So I say, I, I recommend, um, do not spend time, energy, thought deciding whether or not your site is vulnerable, just spend that time applying the patch and pushing it through to production. Um, starting with Drupal 8, gosh, that was like nine years ago that was released. Um, Drupal has been based on Symfony. Through earlier versions of Drupal, Drupal 7 and before, were sort of complete package unto themselves, but starting with Drupal 8, we decided to let Symfony do what it does best 
and then we'll build on top of that. Um, and since it relies on Symphony, when the version of Symphony it's using um, reaches its end of life, we have to similarly retire our version of Drupal. So last November, 2023, um, Symphony 4 went end of life, support ended for it, and so Drupal 9 went end of life in November of 2023. Even though we try to have our release schedule be June and December, we had to retire Drupal 9 in November. Um, so, um, so the relationship between Drupal and Symfony is sort of complicated. Um, Drupal 8 was around for five years, and there was a minor version of, a minor upgrade of Drupal that involved a major version of Symfony. I guess that was from two to three. Um, going from Drupal 9 to Drupal 10, we went from Symphony 4 to Symphony 6, skipping a version. Both of those are hard and we never want to do them again. So going forward, Symphony has established its release cadence. There will be a major version of Symphony every two years. Drupal is going to follow that. So that's why Drupal 11 is coming out this year on Symphony 7, I think. And in 2026, I expect to see Drupal 12 on Symphony 8. So that's keeping, avoiding vulnerable and outdated components. Keep your software up to date. Know the release schedule for Drupal. Keep Drupal core and your contrib modules up to date. I guess one more thing I have to say. I see this happened a lot of times. Updating modules doesn't seem to get a very high priority. We want new features. Why do we have to upgrade the old? So what is wrong with that strategy is, is say you've got version 3.2 of the token module and 3.3 and 3.4 and 3.5 have been released and you didn't bother to upgrade them. You say, yeah, there weren't any bugs that bothered me. I don't need any of the new features. And then a security release comes out, 3.6. And now you're upgrading from 3.2 to 3.6, which who knows what that's going to break. Probably the reason you've been putting it off is that it breaks something. And now you have to do that and get past that breakage, do whatever related updates are required under the gun of, of a security release because if you don't update it, your site's vulnerable. So that's the danger of leaving your modules at older versions. So keep your modules up to date so that when a security release does come up, you can apply it promptly. Um, depending on the complexity of your site, the importance of the site, the size of your team, um, update your modules monthly, quarterly, whatever works for you but have it on a regular basis. Don't let it slide. Um, any questions about keeping your modules up to date? Yes? Sometimes when I have to update stuff, I resist updating immediately, unless it says critical or, you know, high severity, um, just because I want to be the early adopter. And I'll wait till the bugs kind of shake out. What do you comment on that from a security perspective? Okay, so the question is that sometimes uh, when an update comes out, I put off updating I, because I don't want to be the early adopter. I want to give them a chance to work out the bugs. Um, that's certainly a reasonable approach for major version upgrades, which are expected to be disruptive. Or frankly, are expected to have some bugs in them. So you might not want to be the first one to jump on the bag wagon with uh, Drupal 11.0. You might want to wait for 11.0.1 .1 or 11.1, .1, six months. Um, but that doesn't apply to security updates because assuming that you're up to date, and you've got the current version, um, the security update is a small change. It's only fixing the one problem and great care has been taken to make sure that it won't break anything. So, so yeah, if, if you, it, it's reasonable to be shy about being the early adopter for a new major version, 
you should not be shy about applying your security updates promptly. Any other questions? Then we get to go back to Choose Your Adventure. Um, broken access control, cryptographic failures, or injection. The top three on the OWASP top 10. Broken access. Broken access control, number one, okay. Um, so, you know, again, crib from the OWASP site, there are various types of vulnerability that fall under this. Um, information disclosure, um, edit delete by an unauthorized user, um, a cross-site request forgery, which I'll talk about more, and, and there are several other things. So those are the things that come under broken access control. Um, so horror stories. Um, this was pretty early in my Drupal career. It was like maybe my third job in Drupal about 10 years ago. And you know, a customer came to us with a Drupal site they were running. Um, and there was custom access control for the edit page. User one edit. And the, the access function had left off a not. So what, what that means is that anyone other than the logged in user one was able to edit the account. Like that's the worst mistake I've ever seen in, in my Drupal career. So how do you protect yourself from mistakes like this? How do you avoid the horror stories? Any, any ideas? Don't do it. Don't do, don't do it. Stuff. Don't make mistakes. Yeah, that's. Well, well just don't. I mean, try to avoid any customizations. To ah. Try to avoid any customizations. Yes, avoid custom code is a great way to keep your software secure. Because I know the Drupal core, it's not perfect, but it's pretty pretty good about security. Contrib modules step below, but still reasonable. Something I write myself. Uh, it should be suspect. It's awfully hard to admit that to yourself, that I might write buggy code, but if you're at all reasonable, you have to admit that it's true. So avoiding custom code is a great way to avoid horror stories. What else can you do? Well, you can also like, limit access on the server level, like put it, put it deny anything, uh, any access to that secure part of it, like if you have a secure interface, only allow the access from a known IP address. Okay, you can use uh, server, le server level access control to protect your user pages. You could restrict it to particular IP addresses. That's true, I don't think it's really an answer to my question. Like, yes, there are lots of things you can do to be secure, but how do you avoid the dumb mistakes that lead to horror stories? And I, and although, Maybe I, I will sort of generalize your suggestion. Um, defense in depth is a good strategy. So even if you make a mistake at your server level access control, you have a second level of, of access control in, in Drupal, the application level, defense in depth will help you. Um, you had a suggestion? Well, I was going to say for this particular thing, I mean, we disable the user one account um, on our platform. Uh, but now that I think of it, would that have if you're on your, yeah, when you edit your account, can you disable your account? I, I, so I, I think um, the suggestion is to disable or to block user one. Um, but I, yeah, I think if you have access to the edit page, you, you can unblock it. And there was an idea in the back. Um, well, I just realized your header says custom modules. What I, what I was going to say is only use modules from Drupal.org. Um, yeah, so the suggestion is on, only use modules from Drupal.org. That's, again, another way of saying the first suggestion we had, which was not to use custom code. Yes? Have someone else check your work. Have someone else check your work. That's a good suggestion. Um, if you do need custom code, make sure it gets reviewed. Um, 
So code review is, in fact, the first answer I gave. Um, have automated tests. Like, if you're going to do something important, like access control, I don't know why this site I was looking at thought they needed to customize that. But access control is important. Everyone knows that. If you're doing, using custom code for something important, then test it. And avoid custom code. The third thing I wrote down is, is also the suggestion we got here. Um, I think that if customers knew the true cost of custom code, they would ask for less of it or pay more for it. Um, and also one of my themes is that anything that's good for code quality in general is good for security. So code review, automated tests, and less of it. When you say automated tests, where are we uh, improving your devices? This is, uh, but when you say automated tests, what about automated tests are you talking about for this? When I say automated tests, what do I mean? Well, um, if you've got access control for user accounts, then write a functional test that tries to log in with the right password and tries to log in without the right password. Um, I'm, I'm also a fan of, of unit tests and um, lots of tests. So um, I mentioned cross-site request forgery um, as, as one of the um, examples of broken access control, and this is one of the most common um, sort of vulnerability that comes under this heading. Um, so what is it? So on mysite.com, you might have an image tag, and the source, instead of going to an actual image file, is say https colon slash slash example.com slash node slash one, two, three, slash delete. So that's what makes it cross-site. So on mysite.com, we have a link to example.com. That's cross-site. Now, what is the point of this? Um, an administrator for example.com visits mysite.com. And what happens? Um, loads the web page, and because there, there's an image with a source attribute, um, the web browser tries to go to that URL and load the page. And what does, in, on a Drupal site, what does node slash one, two, three slash delete do? Deletes the page. It deletes the page. So if I'm an administrator and I go to that page, I delete the node, and this is what a cross-site request forgery is. It tricks me, maybe by embedding um, the URL in an image tag. There are various other ways of doing it, like JavaScript. Um, to go to the site where I'm an admin and, and do something. Could be deleting a page, could be creating a user account. You know, like it doesn't take too much imagination to think of all the damage you can do if you can get this to work. So here are a few questions. Why does this particular attack not work? I'm an admin, I happen to be currently logged in on example.com. I could delete that page if I wanted to. Um, and as I load this page on mysite.com, it is fetching that as me from my browser. Why doesn't that delete the page? Yes? Uh, the browser will prevent cross domain uh, requests like this? Uh, right. So one answer is that browsers have some protection against cross-site request forgeries built in. and. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure that works here. Like, if it were an actual image file on another site, it would still get fetched, wouldn't it? Yeah, I'm, you're making a request from one domain to another. Um, my browser is requesting... Yeah, Maybe. I was going to say the uh, Are You Sure page would come up. Right. The, the second answer is the Are You Sure page, or, or what I call the, the confirmation form. Um, and, and that is one thing in Drupal that, uh, that, that prevents this from working, that just visiting the page isn't enough. 
when I visit that page as an admin, I'll get a confirmation form. I have to submit that, which is a post request, not just a get request. Second question, what incorrect assumptions expose similar vulnerabilities? Like this is sort of a baby example of a cross-site request forgery. Hackers are very clever, they come up with much more involved ones. But what are the incorrect assumptions that might make something like this effective? That you're already logged in. Um, one assumption is that you're already logged in. Well, but if I am logged in, then I do have the permission to delete pages or create user accounts or do whatever else. So my answers are, um, to the first question, as I said, use confirmation forms. Um, and the second answer of how you can prevent it from work is that you should expect users to tweak URLs. Like, you know, sometimes innocuous users will do it just because they're experimenting or they're trying to get to a page and blah, blah, blah. And sometimes they can be malicious. So they might add slash edit to whatever URL you give them. They might add slash delete and more. Um, especially when processing forms, do not assume that form requests come from the form you have provided. When someone fills out your form, they're submitting a post request. They can also submit a post request directly and put whatever payload they want in it that's going to try to break your site. So don't assume that the data you're getting is the data that is intended. Um, use special tokens to prevent cross-site request forgeries. And I'm not going to go into that, but um, I do provide a link to the page on Drupal.org explaining how to do that. Um, and remember that forms are hard and that a web content management system is really one of the worst ideas ever from a security point of view. Thank you. So. Um, one of the things I promised in the issue description is to say how these things are communicated. So here is um, an actual security advisory from 2021. Um, it was a core vulnerability, Project Drupal Core, the date. Um, the security risk, that's sort of mumbo jumbo, but if you, um, it, it, it does mean something. The vulnerability is called a cross-site request forgery and there's a CVE ID. Um, if you actually look at this, security advisory in Hover, um, you can see a brief explanation of, of what those abbreviations mean. How, what is the level of access complexity, um, what authentication is required to exploit it, and so forth. Um, so that security advisory is, is, is what it looks like. Um, and this comes out, it's published on the web page, it's in the RSS feed, it comes to your email if you've subscribed. Um, all, all the uh, channels I talked about earlier. And then the description is, the Drupal core media module allows embedding internal and external media and content fields. In certain circumstances, the filter could allow an unprivileged user to inject HTML into a page when it is accessed by a trusted user with permission to embed media. So that's basically the idea of a CS cross-site request forgery that I talked about before that you trick in, uh, another user into following the link. In some cases, this could lead to cross-site scripting. So that is how Drupal communicates this sort of vulnerability. Um, and the fix, um, I could look at the code. It's actually a fairly simple fix. And, um, and it just adds a token to make sure that um, but what a CSRF token does is it, 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 it tries to guarantee that the post request you're getting actually comes from the form that you think it comes from. So it tries to validate that assumption that I told you a minute ago not to make blindly. But it's not an assumption, it's something that you check. So let me so just... The token, it's come from the same server that's looking for the token, so it'll match. Yes, when, when you're building the form, you add the, the cross-site request forgery token and then when you process the form, you, you make sure that it's the same one. So let me just briefly go through the conclusion. Um, 
that's the list of where we've been. Um, some references, some contributed modules that can help with security. And I'm out of time, but I encourage you to ask questions before. But any last minute questions? Okay, well, thanks for coming and keep your site secure.